it is two o'clock and I think uh, for the purposes of uh, maintaining time, we start. We've got 51 participants altogether. We had many more registrations. So we're hoping that as, you know, in the next couple of minutes, we'll have, you know, in, you know, we'll have more people joining in, but I think we should start for the purposes of keeping to time. So saying that, I would like to all, I would like to thank all of you today and uh, give a warm welcome to all of you from the Nordic Center in India. We're happy to ha have all of you with us for this webinar titled Nordic Research Landscapes, Collaboration Opportunities for India. The aim of this webinar is to highlight the research landscape of the Nordic countries concerned and Lithuania and present opportunities available for research, funding lines for individuals and projects for joint research facilitated by national, Nordic, multilateral and bilateral agencies. Uh, for the purposes of efficient time management, as I had said before, and to enable more interaction with the panelists, I will keep the format crisp. And therefore, I am happy to introduce Dr. Mika Thirunen, Councillor of Education and Science at the Embassy of Finland in New Delhi. The screen is all yours, Mika. Please begin. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to be here. Greetings from the Finnish Embassy. I'm sitting really here in New Delhi and hope you all are in a safe place wherever you are. Situation is challenging, like we all know. Okay, I tell you something about the uh, uh, research uh, opportunities with and in Finland, uh, how, to, how to make the way to, to, to Finland. You maybe every now and then you see some news about Finland and the different kinds of rankings. It's funny that it is now fourth time in row. Finland is the happiest country in the world. We Finns always wonder that why is that? Do are we really happy? I, I don't know if I, I'm happy or not. But when you look at these rankings, actually the essential thing is that all Nordic countries are there at the top, uh, and so it indicates certainly something um, about the society, stability of society, and uh, services and equality and many many things, uh, safety that are common actually to all Nordic countries. Another thing that is common when whatever ranking you, you look uh, uh, globally, this is another innovation scoreboard. Uh, it's not uh, the latest one, but uh, it, nevertheless, the picture is, remains normally more or less the same. So it indicates that the innovation leaders in Europe, they come from certain countries like UK, Germany, Netherlands, but uh, you always normally find the Nordic countries there, there as well. So it tells again some story about Nordic uh, speciality, Nordic uh, in innovation, uh, whatever makes this thing. In Finland, we have quite a, a comprehensive net, network of higher education institutes. A country is large by area, so um, that the government has, uh, has this policy to keep all areas active. So that's why we have universities basically everywhere, except the northernmost part where we have just research stations. Uh, the most uh, northernmost university in the world is in Finland. It's the only university in above the north, uh, uh, northern circle, polar circle, the University of Lapland. Um, uh, as for funding, uh, I don't don't get scared. I don't go into details. I'm just saying here when we look at the middle panel that there are uh, two uh, th uh, three funders who are giving funds based on competition, namely Academy of Finland, which is the prime funding agency for. Uh, uh, basic research, then strategic research council, which is more kind of applied uh, side, and then business Finland, which is giving money for for companies, and then big bunch of the money goes directly to the universities. What this means is that if you, if any of you is interested to conduct research in Finland, uh, there are basically two ways. Uh, one is to uh, join a Finnish university to apply apply funds from the Academy of Finland, or then to directly apply uh, to put open positions in, in the universities, for instance, for professorship or assistant position that they are, they uh, announce them in your access uh, network normally. So it's not that hard to find the positions, open positions. This is just to show you, uh, I'm only talking about this uh, biggest circle, the light blue one, which is about researcher oriented funding in the Academy of Finland. So what this tells is that there are these specific funding tools. So 
meaning that any any Indian, for instance, uh, who wants to uh, join a Finnish research team uh, can apply all these funds in this uh, blue uh, uh, biggest circle, for instance, academy professorship or, or academy fellowships or postdoc positions or, or different kinds of research uh, team leader positions. So you just need to have an affiliation to, to a certain university. So you need to agree with the university that, okay, uh, I would love to join and then let's apply together. And actually, for instance, uh, these postdoctoral positions already more than 30%, 30 to 40% are occupied by foreigners. So it's very, uh, it's, it has become very international uh, funding scheme, actually. Of course, there's competition, especially when you go up to the academic professorships, they are very, very competed. But uh, if, you, if you are really good, then, then why not? So here are the strongholds of Finnish research. When you look at the comparisons like OECD, uh, the best 10%, most cited uh, 10%, uh, where mean value is one. So everything above one is over the average. So this shows that, um, interestingly, actually to me as well, business studies and economics is quite strong. There was a Nobel Prize to a Finnish uh, research given a few years ago. Uh, in, in economics. Humanity is also strong, agricultural and forest sciences. That is not a surprise uh, because of the huge uh, forest areas in Finland. ICT and electrical engineering is maybe one that we all more or less know be, uh, about Finland. We have those uh, Nokia things and all, all those uh, game, game uh, companies and, and so on. And then mathematics and statistics, for instance, these are the strong strongholds. Uh, I, then the Academy of Finland has many uh, different kinds of a center of action and funding tools, but there's one that I, I would like to highlight here, which is a flagship program uh, where we have now currently 10 flagships. And the idea of flagships in Finland is that they are the cutting edge research globally at the top of the, uh, the, the uh, global uh, scheme, so, so really top-notch research. And the funding is very, uh, uh, th th that is really uh, abundant. So it means that uh, the first program of these six uh, teams was uh, uh, 0.5 billion uh, euro for three years. So it's quite a uh, quite big uh, bunch of money. And uh, the thing is that they are all, these are networks. So it means that uh, these are networks of universities, but also companies are involved. So anybody who is interested, for instance, to first come in to make some research, and then maybe later to uh, for either get employed to a company or to establish an own spin-off. Uh, uh, these are very good places actually to join. Or if you are looking uh, for uh, postdoc or PhD positions, uh, simply directly connection to these uh, group leaders is a uh, is very easy way to, to get uh, the, um, a dialogue going on. So these are the areas, uh, 6G is one area where Finland is the leader. It truly, uh, AI is, is very strong. Uh, and then uh, this cancer medicine, uh, in, in, in inequalities and interventions and new welfare state is one, um, materials, bioeconomy and photonics. This was the first call uh, a few years ago and, and this year they added, uh, no sorry, last of all they added this for atmosphere and climate competence center, which is uh, the, the leader in, in, in the world. They, the leader uh, professor was most cited geoscientist globally six years in a row. So it does something about this uh, excellency. Uh, and then gene, gene and cell therapy uh, in flames is in on, on immune system. And then forest human machine interplay, which is a quite multidisciplinary forest research uh, flagship. So these are uh, just examples. Of course, like I said, there are center of excellence programs and other uh, programs for emerging uh, top uh, teams, but these are the, truly the flagships that if you want to be safe, that engage with the best ones. So then they, these are the 10, 10 are for that uh, purpose. Uh, then an interesting thing that um, the, 
the, there is a project to establish the fastest supercomputer in public research in Europe, in Finland. This is a multinational consortium where Finland is the host country. This is going to be 10 times faster supercomputer than the, the, the fastest nowadays. So it's a part 50% funded by EU and then the rest is shared by the member, uh, member countries. You can see those countries on, on the map. Um, then about Indo-Finnish R&D collaboration, we, we have been building, building up um, partnerships with India. Our prime ministers had a dialogue just uh, one month ago uh, where they announced uh, digital partnership and sustainability partnership and also announced a high level dialogue on education. And then uh, we have joined the uh, Science and Technology Commission, which actually is the body to handle these partnerships. So those uh, two, two uppermost topics are, uh, are conducted in by a uh, joint commission. And within digital partnership, uh, five to six G, quantum computing and digital transformation of education are have been selected. And then in sustainability, we focus basically on two things. One is energy, clean energy uh, and uh, waste to energy kind of things. And then climate change, uh, atmospheric research, uh, which relates to air quality as well. So these are the, the uh, key things the, the we don't have um, uh, currently uh, bilateral funding for, for research projects. This has been, uh, uh, we, we stopped having them like a few years ago. So we have mob mobility funds uh, by the Academy of Finland. And then these uh, universities, uh, they, they have specific funds for collaborating with India. Actually, there's a pilot funding from uh, 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 the uh, Ministry of Education, 1 million euro a year shared to six to seven universities to collaborate with India. Uh, then, of course, if, if there are any people interested in study opportunities, I don't go too much on this now, but I just uh, briefly so that uh, there are plenty of English uh, study programs, degree programs that you can check in study in Finland website. Uh, the situation is, is challenging for everybody. That's why last year the Minister of Education uh, changed the regulation a little bit so that uh, it is possible to register as an absent uh, student during the first academic year. So students can stay in, in, in India if, if, that is, uh, if, if it is difficult to move to Finland and then start their studies uh, online. So this is uh, possible. Uh, here are some reasons why Finland, uh, many good reasons, good universities. And I would say that uh, actually many, uh, if, if I talk to students or researchers in Finland, uh, it's easy to understand that Nordic countries actually are very connected in many ways. So if any of those research teams, for instance, that I presented uh, previously have a very close connections to Nordic uh, top universities. So they, they are very, also very Nordic ones. I don't go in details here. This is a, the time, uh, time, uh, the, 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 the scale year, how you say, a year uh, period when the calls are open for different uh, programs. So, but this is, uh, I can share this slide to, to, uh, through Christopher. And doctoral studies in Finland are paid fully, basically. It takes, takes normally four years. Uh, and then, uh, Professors, faculties can be contacted at any time directly, but in study info, there are programs, specific programs with certain uh, uh, timeline when to apply, how to apply. And then just a few slides uh, about the startup ecosystem. Startup permit that allows a quick uh, access to Finland uh, immigration and then public support uh, by ad advising uh, advisory bodies uh, to help in the very beginning and then uh, discounts on, on certain services and then uh, startup kit that uh, that helps uh, the, the uh, companies you can go and have a look at this website and so that's basically my story so uh, I am here, like I said, in, in New Delhi. We have here business, also Business Finland uh, office. 
which is uh, taking care of the, the business side. They also have funding, their own funding uh, programs. And then they have visit in Finland and invest in Finland and Talent Boost, which is uh, for attracting talent uh, students uh, and experts uh, from uh, India to, to Finland. So thank you for your attention. That was all. Thank you, Mika, for a very efficient and informative look at the options available in terms of research funding and opportunities for Indo-Finnish cooperation. I think the flagship program may be of interest to quite a lot of people in India. I do not immediately see any questions uh, being raised. Uh, pa uh, participants are encouraged to put in all their questions in the chat box, and we will then accordingly uh, address the questions from there. And if we have no questions for Mika, then let's move ahead. And representing Denmark is Dr. Jakob Williams Erberg, who is the Counselor for Innovation, Research and Higher Education at the Royal Danish Embassy, New Delhi. Jakob, please go ahead. Thank you, Christopher. Um, first of all, do you see uh, something that looks like a PowerPoint on the screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to congratulate Christabel and, and uh, the team at uh, NCI and at JNU at uh, the fantastic uh, school you have uh, given us uh, this week and the fantastic lineup of, uh, of Nordic uh, professors. I think that um, what we are giving you today uh, whoever has, uh, has decided to listen in, is maybe a little bit more of, a, of the sales pitch for, for, for the Nordic societies. And uh, those who have followed the summer school this week will have uh, gotten the deeper understanding of the, of the societies we represent. As you will see uh, from my presentation, uh, Finland and Denmark are the same. Uh, the only difference is that uh, we are not number one in happiness. Uh, but we used to be. Um, and I think we could say that Norway and Sweden are just like uh, us and the same for Iceland. And then we have the Baltics. I think uh, we share so much history that we are all comparable. Uh, I want to tell you that um, we all uh, represent societies that I think are open and uh, that are uh, worth a visit and not not least uh, worth your attention uh, for your career, for your studies, or for collaboration. But um, let me uh, go ahead with the message from Denmark. Okay. So we are a small country, uh, open economy, and uh, uh, high on competitive, uh, competitiveness and so forth. Um, we are uh, the smallest uh, of the of, of the, the Scandinavian uh, countries, a very uh, uh, maritime uh, society and very closely uh, connected uh, both to the rest of the Nordics and to Europe. Uh, we like to say that uh, we are, we are a high tax, bad weather uh, country, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but still we have uh, something to offer. Um, for the purpose of today, um, here are the, 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 the eight universities in Denmark. Um, they are distributed uh, across uh, our small nation. Uh, most of them are in the Copenhagen area, but, uh, but um, they are uh, comprehensive uh, uh, universities, most of them, and uh, of a, a high quality. We, do not have so much uh, distribution in quality of our education and uh, research system. Uh, everything is quite spread out. Um, uh, for business, uh, there's Copenhagen Business School as the, as the key uh, school. We do have a specialist university called IT University of Copenhagen for IT, but we also have IT degrees in the other uh, schools. Roskilde University, which is quite famous, uh, is a is one that focuses uh, on a different kind of teaching, uh, which is project-based, and the same can be said for Aalborg University. Aarhus University and University of Copenhagen, same with Southern Denmark uh, University, are classic comprehensive universities. 
and then we have the, the Technical University of Denmark or DTU, which is our uh, prime uh, technical university. Jakob, uh, just yeah. quickly, that I think the screen is frozen on the first slide. We've not been oh, able. Really? To... Yeah. It says sharing is paused. Okay. Um, do, you, do you see a PowerPoint now, or do you see some random pictures from the duck? We just see the first page of your PowerPoint, the first screen, research, innovation, and education opportunities. We okay. just you know these from you. Um, and now? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Um, yes, now we see your screen. Okay. And now you see uh, some people sitting at a canal in Aarhus? Yes. Okay. Um, our, uh, our public institutional framework for, for higher education and research also has seven university colleges, which is mostly for, for uh, teaching and uh, nursing and these public sector uh, domain uh, vocational uh, degrees. And then we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, arrangements for promoting innovation. Um, in these times of uh, a global uh, uh, catastrophe, which, which demands a scientific response, I think this is a very important uh, statistics. Uh, we are society of citizens that believe in science and that put science forward when we look at how to change our lives to the better. Um, we have a high take up of, of the advice, for example, for uh, combating COVID uh, nowadays. But in general, uh, you would find if you join us that, uh, that uh, your work is uh, respected and it will be present in the media. It will be present in public discourse as a foundation for how we do politics. We like to say that we do research which is uh, for society and in society. So that also means that we work very closely between our research institutes and our universities and the public sector and the private sector. And that uh, is not only a, a thing in engineering, this is also in social science and in humanities. All the different uh, degrees that people study in Denmark, all the different research groups, I encourage to uh, make uh, the research projects uh, uh, come forward in partnership with uh, societal partners. In relation to India, we, uh, we work under what we call a green strategic partnership. So in our research funding and in our research uh, public research strategy, we have put climate change and the SDGs in the forefront. And now we're trying to follow the same when we do our international collaboration. So that means that when we, uh, when we work with India, we work not within a, the frame of a classic strategic uh, collaboration, but within a green strategic collaboration. So we are focused on what we together as nations can do on the SDGs and on the climate. This has uh, an effect, of course, in how we do our science and technology collaboration with India. We look at areas that are very uh, focused on, on pollution and on uh, mitigation of the effects of climate change. And also in, of course, uh, greening uh, the economy in terms of uh, green energy and so forth. I've listed uh, four areas here. That, um, that, that are our focus area uh, uh, nowadays in discussion with the Indian side. It's very broad, but it's also very much focused on environment and sustainability. When we think these uh, issues, we like to think them as connected to social science and humanities as well. 
but of course uh, the way we have designed our research collaboration right now is that we focus on the sciences and the engineering when we do bilateral funding i will come back to other ways of then working together for social sciences and humanities uh, researchers we also have uh, what we call the innovation center denmark uh, here in india which is tasked with uh, creating projects and creating partnerships that uh, deliver on this agenda so we like to think of ourselves as a country that work very dedicated in the triple helix model so industry public sector and the scientific community working together on uh, global and societal challenges and we like to uh, to uh, think of our work here and that is uh, what we do on a daily basis as creating our triple helix with your triple helix just want to uh, to tell you that in the bottom there you see uh, some some more uh, uh, pinpointed uh, areas that we work in. We have uh, bilateral calls between India and Denmark. As of now, we focus on water, energy, uh, ICT, and uh, what we call cyber physical systems, as well as on, as on agriculture. Right now, we're uh, figuring out what we'll do next time, but it will most likely be something that supports our green strategic partnership. So the, the, the topics that were listed before. That said, all our universities should be international and are already highly international. And we like to see a lot more work going on in the areas uh, of humanities and social science. And of course, in, in other areas that are very strong at JNU such as uh, climate and uh, even uh, Arctic or, or high alpine research. But um, we, we will then not uh, necessarily promote it through our bilateral uh, funding schemes, but through some of the other funding schemes that, that, uh, that we have in Denmark and, and in Europe. So here is listed um, uh, uh, some, some, uh, some short facts about it. Uh, the EU Marie Curie program is one where the Danish universities are very uh, active and successful in, uh, in, uh, in getting uh, talent from abroad, including India. And all the universities have special uh, systems uh, to support this. Many of them have uh, grants where they invite the, the foreign researcher to campus for a short time in order to prepare the application together with the host researcher. Um, we would also like, I would also just, just like to mention that all our uh, positions are open to the world and uh, internationalization is a criteria that, uh, that the groups that are appointing uh, 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 new recruits to universities should look at and promote. Here are some, some more facts that, that are supportive of, of this. Uh, including that uh, accompanying spouses can actually work, that some universities have uh, dual career opportunities and, and most universities have services to support it at least. We also give uh, special tax uh, rebates uh, to the international uh, researchers when they come. As mentioned before, we welcome uh, all uh, but of course, there are some areas where I think we are uh, a little bit ahead of the curve uh, uh, internationally and uh, where uh, uh, that I would like to highlight here as more attractive, especially in the medicine and in the, the natural sciences, where, for example, Niels Bohr Institute at University of Copenhagen is uh, probably uh, world renowned and also very known in, in India. When you look at, uh, at uh, finding a, a path uh, to work uh, or to collaborate with Denmark, I want to mention that we do have, as I mentioned before, the public uh, funding schemes and our bilateral program, but we also have a very strong sector of philanthropics. And if this, uh, these slides are shared by Christopher afterwards, then do uh, go into some of these foundations and look at them and see the programs where they fund international 
researchers setting up either groups or setting up a career in Denmark. But also look at all the areas that they fund. Because when you start talking to the Danish researchers for collaboration, those are the areas that they can apply for. And for public funding and for private philanthropic funding, it all it, the same thing counts. They can fund activities in India. They can fund Indian researchers and Indian institutions, as long as it supports the development of Danish science, science and Danish uh, institutions. Did I stop sharing? No. Right now, we have a few things uh, that I think you should look at. The first thing is called the International Network Program. It's a call that closes the 2nd of June. It allows you to have a network between India and Denmark where you would be given up until I think uh, uh, 2 million uh, Indian rupees um, to support uh, network activities, travel back and forward, stay at each other's uh, uh, universities. The idea is that people come together in this program who are not already collaborating, but who find that they have a joint research agenda and that they would like to develop uh, towards further collaboration, for example, uh, through uh, uh, project applications for Horizon or, or for the the philanthropic uh, um, programs. Another uh, program that is very important for us, as mentioned, was this EU Marie Curie, where there's RISE, which is putting together research groups a little bit in the same manner I just told you, but in, in a much better funded uh, way and with much longer stays at each other's uh, schools. We have the innovative training program with which, uh, which provides uh, PhDs across Europe. If you go into this link uh, from Euraxis um, that I've provided here on this slide, you'll find that right now we have 150 uh, open positions, uh, scientific positions in Denmark, spanning PhD through postdoc to professor level in all the different fields. And, uh, and they are all open uh, for Indian uh, applications. If there are students online, and I think there will be I'm not completely sure how, how the, uh, who, who, ha who has uh, joined uh, this call. Then do go in and check this uh, study in Denmark link, uh, which gives you uh, an introduction to all the universities. Most of the universities have uh, good uh, uh, English language programs in all levels, but our main focus is providing English language programs uh, for the master level and the PhD level. In those, uh, we are very happy to receive applications. Um, we do it a little bit different than some of the other Nordic countries in the sense that we offer more places in the areas in which Denmark needs qualified uh, work, uh, of uh, qualified uh, talent. So that also means that you will find that all these programs are very focused on bringing you from studying to working in Denmark. As uh, Mika was showing, uh, there's the opportunity of working while studying and also staying uh, afterwards uh, on, a little, on a short green card. Um, so that is, I think, uh, standard across the Nordics. But I think it also testifies that what we see these uh, international student programs as, it's not about making money to the universities, because actually that's not uh, really a reality, but it's about uh, internationalizing our universities and internationalizing our nations and our labor markets. Let's see. Uh, now I stopped sharing again, I think. Right? We can, we can still see your screen. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, yeah. This is just a little commercial for Denmark, right? Uh, that is uh, meant to be the, the, the classic Danish streetscape. Actually, from this month until October, it is. It is a true and re uh, reality. Um, we like to see you in Denmark, but we also like to collaborate with you in India. Um, do contact me if you want to uh, to go more into the opportunities uh, that we have before us. Um, 
I will either help you directly or find the person in Denmark that can help you. As uh, I think is the reality for all um, research uh, collaboration, the active ingredients is the researchers. So I really encourage you to get to know the Danish universities, contact the people that match you, and then turn to me for help in bringing uh, you together in Denmark or in India or online or in projects or what or not. We have many ways of helping you, but we need you to get together first. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob. Thank you for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. There are quite a few questions that have come up. Uh, one standard question that keeps repeating is uh, related to uh, knowledge about postdoctoral opportunities uh, in social sciences, both uh, in Denmark. I don't know if Mika is there, but uh, you can answer for Denmark, of course. Postdoctoral, what kind of postdoctoral opportunities mm -hmm. are available in the social sciences? And related uh, question also in the humanities. Yes, yes, yes. So um, I don't know if Mika is there, but I think uh, it is also true for for his uh, his country that our our um, uh, our public uh, uh, funding programs uh, are open uh, to Indian applicants, uh, also for the postdoc uh, level, and we have what is called the Independent Research Foundation that offers uh, uh, project funding uh, and postdoc funding in. Uh, in, um, in social science and the humanities. Competition is quite tough, but uh, find, uh, go find a professor that wants to host you and then see if you can uh, do a, a, an application together. Other thing is, of course, the Marie Curie. As mentioned, all the universities have ways of supporting uh, their uh, faculty in recruiting uh, Indian uh, postdocs uh, through the Marie Curie uh, schemes. Uh, right now, I think is actually when they usually uh, have the recruitment meetings uh, in uh, at the universities. Situation might be a little bit different this year, and then I think that the deadline usually is in September. Um, yeah, and then uh, now it's social science and humanities. So I think the Carlsberg Foundation. You should check that one out as well. And then uh, if you are already in conversations with the, with the Danish uh, researchers uh, that will host you, uh, you should also look into uh, the Velux Foundation. They might have some opportunities for applying for your position uh, through the Velux Foundation. Most important is finding a research area that is uh, needed and uh, define a research project, which is very good with a Danish uh, or Danish-based uh, uh, partner. Most of the funds can be applied for outside, from outside as well, but you need some sort of hook in the Danish uh, system to be uh, successful. I don't know if that's okay, Christopher. Or should I... Yes, uh, Dr. Okay. Bharati Aintal has asked, do we have a forum to share our interests and have probable experts from Denmark also show some interest in it. This may help to start easy collaboration. Any kind of forum wherein you can get interested parties on both sides. Does that something like that exist? It's called the Nordic Center in India. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, of course, uh, uh, we have uh, all, uh, all the five Nordics and, uh, and the three Baltics, I think, have, uh, have someone responsible for uh, for higher education and research. Um, so if you don't have the, the partner, why don't you get in touch? Uh, use the email address right there and then, uh, and then uh, see, uh, see if, uh, if I can help you. We don't have this um, online portal or something like that, but the European Union has that. So, but I think we have, we have the five embassies from the Nordics, the three from the Baltics, and we have the Nordic Center in India. So it's not that we, we don't have any uh, way of mediating the interest, thanks. Another question is with regard it's, uh, with regards to what you are doing with the Green Strategic uh, Partnership. Uh, people want to know if there's any kind of funding available to study glaciology, water chemistry, environmental studies, things like that. So they're looking for research opportunities in the area of water chemistry, environmental aspects, as well as study in research in Greenland. 
<laughs> Greenland, that's fantastic. Um, uh, Greenland, and we have um, we have a, a new uh, international hub in uh, Greenland that is supposed to to uh, to globalize, uh, you know, the, the work of, of the different universities' uh, research stations in Greenland. Um, I'm sure Man will also provide some opportunities in, 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 the, in, in Norway uh, on this. Um, do we have special funds for it? Well, we have our independent research institutes and we have our philanthropics that are all active in, 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 uh, in supporting uh, Arctic and resource research and deep sea uh, research. Um, under the Green Strategic Partnership, I think we will not do any bilateral programs supporting the Arctic uh, just uh, this year. But uh, look, at, uh, look out for us uh, for the bilateral funding uh, when it comes to environment issues and these things. We will have to uh, develop uh, the program with, uh, with our Indian partners over the next half year. But uh, uh, yeah, and those are probably the, the kind of the frameworks uh, that we can offer. Uh, in that. Again, uh, the Danish researchers, they know where to go for funding. And uh, so, so do the partnerships. So from, from School of Environment, I, uh, uh, I guess, uh, and Sustainability is it called at GNU. Um, I think, uh, you know, some research groups uh, at the University of Copenhagen. And uh, if you don't know uh, the rest in Denmark, then I'll be happy to, to do more to, uh, to, um, to, to make the links. I visited with a group uh, a year and a half ago, but then COVID came, so we haven't really uh, taken it any further. I think in the interest of saving time, when there are, where there are questions regarding specific disciplinary opportunities, I would request the uh, participants to write us an email so that we can take it forward with Jakob and uh, we can get specific answers to those specific questions. So thank you, Jakob. And now we move forward to Dr. Mann. And um, uh, it's our pleasure to introduce Dr. Mann Singh Sidhu, who's the Science, Technology and Higher Education Counselor at the Royal Norwegian Embassy, New Delhi. Man, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christopher. Am I audible, first of all? Yes, you are. Thank you. Uh, uh, dear moderator, Christopher, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my pleasure, actually. Uh, and I'm very good afternoon to everyone. And thank you, Nordic Center of India, for inviting Norwegian uh, Embassy Delhi, as well as Innovation Norway, to participate in this webinar. Nordic research uh, aiming collaboration opportunities for uh, for Indians. Uh, as as uh, Christopher mentioned, that uh, I'm counselor for science, technology, and innovation uh, and higher education at the Royal Norwegian Embassy, New Delhi. So I am representing the Research Council of Norway, the Norwegian Agency for International Cooperation and Quality Enhancement in Higher Education, that is DQ, and third one is Innovation Norway. In a this I would like to emphasize that I have got three hats in Delhi, so this makes me more. Uh, I have got more mandate to actually find and explore and help Indian co partners to collaborate with Norwegian partner uh, partners. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. This yes. Uh, let me start with uh, with uh, some strength of Norway. Uh, Norway economy, economy is uh, largely, largely based on agriculture, timber and forest, fishing, oil and gas, etc. And uh, most of you may be know that Norway has got only 5.3 million population. It's a very small country and is recognized as one of the leading countries uh, in offering the high standard research and development extra infrastructure. Uh, according to European Innovation Scoreboard, Norway has ranked among Europe 10 most innovative countries. So this makes again, gives um, opportunities for Indian partners to find and explore opportunities to collaborate with Norway. Uh, on the other hand, India is a world large democracy and is rapidly growing emerging economy. Its geopolitical role, its huge population, its long coastal and line and its booming economy makes India an important uh, partner for Norway. Developing in India will have significant impact 
and how successful in world is in achieving the sustainable development goal at the global climate targets is very important for Norway to follow. Ties between uh, Norway and India have deep historical roots. There has been several political, scientific, business delegation visits from both countries. Uh, and uh, this has opened several opportunities for cooperation between Norway and India. Few years back in December, 2018, the Norwegian government has launched a strategy of cooperation with India that is called Norway India 2030. Followed by launching this strategy, uh, our prime minister, Ms. Arna Sulberg, came to India in January, 2019. And she, she had a like three day state visit. She has accompanied by senior officials and large scientific business delegations. As I said uh, in my previous speech uh, uh, slide, that India is one of the important strategic partners for Norway. Therefore, to achieve the objectives, Norwegian government has set out some, some uh, strategic goals. Uh, and the Norwegian government is making use of these relevant agencies and different government bodies and find how this could be strengthened and how this, could, this goal would be achieved. And there are three main areas which are specifically mentioned in this strategy. The one is political contest and cooperation between the authorities. And the second is business cooperation. And third is research and education collaboration. Norway has identified and we prioritize several areas of cooperation with India. And on that, these are mentioned and prioritized in my slide. And um, among them, Research and education is one of the important area. Norwegian government has therefore encouraged Norwegian universities and research institutes to have a clear international profile and engagement so that they can make their mark in global competition. Increased student mobility is a goal of Norwegian government. This implies in both ways increasing the number of outgoing student and incoming student. Therefore, Norwegian government has recently launched a white paper on international student mobility. The long-term goal is to raise the proportion of students studying abroad, abroad from 16% to 50%. This means that the, in future, half of the Norwegian students would spend their study times in abroad. But due to the current COVID pandemic, this has posed a great challenge to the international cooperation. However, we, we, we have also seen that international cooperation is more than important than ever. We must ensure that the students and the future graduates are provided with skill they need for the future. And they have able to work across borders and across disciplines. Therefore, we are very much open to move forward with collaboration approach between Norway and India during and beyond this COVID pandemic. We remain hopeful and we will be able to welcome exchange of students in upcoming semester in 2021. This is the second strategy, which is very important for strengthening the Indo-Norwegian cooperation. This is, what, this is called Paranoma strategy. In fact, this is a very new updated Paranoma strategies two that has been launched this week, uh, I think three days ago. This is, this is valid for 2021 to 2027 and uh, for the next seven years. And, and this is this strategy is minoring from program period for Horizon Europe and Erasmus Plus. It is a strategy of cooperation within higher education and research with nine prioritized partner countries, including India. The aim of the strategy is this strategy is to connect higher education, research, and innovation cooperation good interaction with business sector as well as student, staff and science, scientist mobility are also strategically aimed in this strategy. As a science and technology counselor, it is very important task for me to facilitate, facilitate collaboration with India in the years to come. In addition, collaboration to solve global challenges and to contribute the SDGs will be an important element 
in the Indo-Norwegian collaboration. As a science and technology counselor, I am coordinating different activities and building the bridge between Indo-Norwegian partnership. The aim of the, com aim of the common effort across the knowledge triangle is to build and strengthen the impact of Indo-Norwegian collaboration on science, technology, and innovation. As I'm having three ad, from one from RCN, and second one is from B2, and third one is from innovation. So all these three agencies have got different aims. Uh, uh, as I have got three hats, so RCN, DECO, and Innovation Norway, my mandate is to explore and strengthen science, technology, and innovation system between India and Norway. Few of them are as to coordinate activities like dialogue with governments, but bodies, strategic, political, and operative uh, activities, promote Norway as attractive and partner for business market, research and education institutions, support institutional partnership, follow-up agreements and MOUs, promote mobility and uh, uh, follow up the joint projects funded by both the countries, staff mobility, research mobility, bilateral calls between India, Norway, and, and of course, Horizon 2020 and upcoming this Horizon Europe and Nordic collaboration. I would like to mention two important programs. One is IMPART. The IMPART program is funding a partnership between Norway, Norwegian higher education and higher institutions, and the excellent partners in different countries, including India. The IMPART program is administrated jointly by the Research Council, as well as DECO. And the second one is Youth First, aiming to strengthen the higher education for sustainable future. This program supports the establishment, establishment of long-term partnership between Norway and different strategic countries, including India. So currently different and several projects are running through these two programs in collaboration with Indian partners. And I will encourage and invite more Indian partners to explore and to be a part of bilateral collaboration in this indo norwegian projects. Here are some statistics uh, and figures are from 2019. And Norway spends 8.4 billion NOC in Norwegian crones in research and development. This is equal to a real growth of just over 2% of GDP on our research and development but expected is 3% toward the next few years. Over 1,500% defended their PhD at Norwegian universities and university college in 2019. And this is like a, a bit, about, approximately 15, uh, 19% more, more than in 2018. In, 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 I mean to say it's increasing year by year. And 14% of the PhD in 2019 were completed by the foreign citizens. And of this, 27% were from Asia. Norway, on the other hand, is participating as a full member uh, since 2094 in the European Framework Program. And Norway received more than, has received more than 2.4% of EU funding in Horizon 2020. And our expectation was 2%. And in that sense, we have reached our expectation and in more. I would just like to uh, highlight some center of research and development where I, I will encourage Indian partners to have a look and find some collaboration collaborities, coll uh, opportunities here. As we have in Norway, we have got three different types of research and development center, and all these are funded from the research concept. These centers are playing a very important role in Norwegian research and development landscape through center of excellence. These centers, again, provide Indian partners to explore collaboration opportunities with Norwegian partners and businesses. These are like center of uh, Norwegian center of excellence. These centers are dedicated to long-term basic research of high international calibers. The second one is center of research-based innovation, which is closely collaborating with the innovative enterprises and business businesses. And the third one is Center for Environmentally Friendly Energy Research. And this is conducting a long-term research 
of higher international calibers to fall specific challenges in the field of energy. Here are the list of uh, what Norwegian government has identified uh, in, in their long-term plan for research and higher education in, in between 2019 and 2028. Sea and ocean is a priority areas. Uh, among, among those are climate, environment, clean energy. We are focusing all, a lot on these fields. Public sectors, renewables and public, uh, better public services is in also important and priority areas. Enabling an industry, technologies, societal, societal security and so, uh, so, uh, social cohesion is also a, in a global context is also important priority area for Norwegian government. As having said that, so we have, uh, we have several strong Norwegian research field uh, where I will encourage uh, Indian partners to have a look and find their interest, common interest in these fields like renewable energies, blue and bioeconomy, circular economy, environmental and climate change, geology, uh, ocean and petroleum technology, climate change, uh, marine science, maritime clinical med medicines. And as one of, uh, one of uh, the, um, the audience also asked about this Arctic science and Arctic science is also very important for Norway uh, and, and is playing very important role in building Indo-Norwegian collaboration in this field. Uh, so uh, this is my last slide. So please don't hesitate to contact me, those who are looking for collaboration and opportunities with the Norway. Uh, to conclude, I would like to thank again uh, the organizers and uh, NCI for providing me this opportunity. And, uh, and I will be happy to take some question uh, if you have. And uh, otherwise, you please feel to contact me uh, after the sessions or if you want to discuss bilaterally your collaboration possibilities with Norwegian partner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Man. Uh, just a question from uh, Oslo Metropolitan University. Alka Goel from Oslo Met is asked, uh, asks, where can she apply for funding for research and collaboration with an Indian hospital in the field for, of, of mental health? Is there any specific uh, research funding that can be found for mental health? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, we have only one research council uh, in Norway and maybe Alka, uh, she knows already that uh, or may not, might be knowing this. Uh, and, um, and I will encourage maybe she should contact the research council of Norway and we have got different programs. And if Alka, if you please contact the research council health program, uh, so they will be able to answer you about this question. And, and a question that comes from me, uh, given that we've got international office representatives across universities in India here among participants, is uh, related to the white paper that you have to increase mobility between Norway and India. How will this functionally be implemented? Will there be a specific call in specific areas? Uh, will, you go, go, will you find partners in India within specific disciplinary areas or is this going to be more organic in the sense that you know the universities need to find each other and get into bilateral ties will this be more top down or will it be more based on interactions between the universities indian and norwegian universities yes this this uh, white paper has been launched last year october so it's too early to find and uh, say something concrete about uh, how this will be functioning but uh, this, uh, the ambition to increase 50% mobility from 16%, current the 16%, current is the 16%, and ambition is to increase to 50% is quite ambitious. Uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, here will be different uh, funding organizations, DQ and RC, and, and uh, different uh, funding organizations will be working uh, uh, together to find some some uh, good options. And uh, and uh, uh, and we will also. Uh, through research council and, and through DECO. So there will be some funding available uh, where we will encourage for, uh, student mobility uh, to be considered during those scientific proposals. Thank you, Dr. Mann. Uh, thank you very much. I would encourage uh, researchers here who have specific questions uh, in, for, in, in uh, regards to specific disciplinary areas to reach out to us or to Dr. Man Singh himself and uh, we can move forward uh, the conversation there. Uh, we now move to, thank you, Dr. Man. We now move to Lena, who is uh, Ms. Lena Aurora Kupreja and she represents Sweden. She's the Senior Advisor, Innovation and Science at the Embassy of Sweden in New, New Delhi. 
Uh, Lina, please go ahead. Hi, thank you, Christabel. Um, just, just checking if the slides are visible and I'm, I'm audible, right? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lena, and today I will talk to you about Innovation Nation Sweden. On the agenda, I have three things. Firstly, I would like to introduce some key facts about Sweden. Secondly, I will describe some key focus areas for the Swedish innovation system and for our international work. And thirdly, I would want to give some examples of existing joint projects and initiatives, as well as share links uh, to the open calls, uh, joint funding calls between Sweden and India. Innovation has always been a crucial uh, pillar in the development of Sweden's welfare. In the late 1800s, Sweden was one of the world's poorest countries. The majority of the population was starving and there were very few large industries to speak of, but then it transformed from being a poor agricultural nation to an industrial society, to one of the world's most digitized countries. Here you see Sweden among our other Nordic partners. Sweden has been ranked as one of the world's leading innovation nation for years. Last year, Sweden was ranked the most innovative country in the EU, and second best on the Global Innovation Index. As you can see on this slide, Sweden has surprisingly large number of multinational export-based companies. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of H&M, Spotify, Ericsson, Volvo, Truecaller, and Ikea. All, all of these are Swedish brands. When it comes to research and development, Sweden's annual investment in R&D is among the highest in the world. 3.3% of GDP was spent on, um, as compared to an OECD average of 2.4%. The large share of these investments, which is approximate 61%, these come from the private sector. Having said that, we also have funding agencies such as the Swedish Research Council, Swedish Energy Agency, the innovation agency called Vinova, Forte and Formas, and all of them have funding uh, opportunities and collaborations along with our Indian R&D funding agencies such as DST, DBT, ICMR, Ministry of Earth Sciences, et cetera. During the past decades, Sweden has developed a world-class startup scene. After Silicon Valley, Stockholm produces the highest number of unicorns. Three of world's top 100 universities are based in Sweden. For a country with a population of 10 million people, that's a very high number. Moving on to um, higher education universities, I would like to highlight a couple, including Karolinska Institute, which is a leading medical university in Stockholm. We also have Royal Institute of Technology, KTH, a leading engineering um, university, Chalmers, Uppsala, Umeå University, all of these are very strong in R&D. In terms of higher education, I also wanted to share with you the very interesting fact that outside of EU, India is the second largest sending country of international students to Sweden. This also means that there is a good base to build on and further develop the bilateral R&D cooperation. Moving on to the innovation areas, I would like to emphasize three flagship programs, innovation partnership programs that were launched by the Swedish Prime Minister. All of these programs work in a triple helix format, which means that there are actors from government, academia, and industry involved in these programs. First, I would like to talk about the climate neutral industry. The government of Sweden has decided that Sweden will be a fossil free society by 2045. The climate neutral industry program aims to strengthen Sweden's export of climate positive products and services. Another important objective is to support the business community's transition to circular business models. Here, I would like to highlight that in Delhi, uh, at the Business Sweden office, we have a showroom, a Sustainability by Sweden showroom, where there is an exhibition of all climate neutral um, products and services for those who are interested uh, to come and visit uh, after the pandemic situation improves. Uh, moving on to digitalization, the Swedish government's overall goal for, is for Sweden to become 
one of the best in world when it comes to using the possibilities of digitalization. A very important objective here is to identify how digital technologies could help solve societal challenges. And this goal really intersects and syncs with Niti Aayog's AI strategy. And we are also collaborating with Indian policymakers at Niti and MIT to also uh, share best practice of transformation of businesses when it comes to digitalization. Moving on to health and life sciences, the government's goal is for Sweden to be a leading life science nation and take a lead in international transition to precision medicine. Um, very recently, uh, just last month, we organized a roundtable with Department of Biotech and BIRAC and other Indian stakeholders in precision medicine and shared best practice when it comes to uh, personalized medicine and data-driven life sciences. Now to throw some light on the bilateral relationship. The key pillar in our bilateral relationship is the Sweden-India Innovation Partnership that was signed jointly by Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Luvian in 2018. In Sweden, the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation is responsible for developing the partnership in close cooperation with the Indian Ministry of Science and Technology. Under the partnership, there are various areas of priority and focus, and these areas are constantly getting a lot of support when it comes to funding by both countries, by both the um, funding agencies in both countries. Transportation is a prioritized area. We recently concluded a Sweden-India mobility hack, which was very successful. Uh, there is also the Sweden-India Transport Innovation Partnership, which was launched last year during Minister Gadkari's visit to Sweden and come countries, companies such as Volvo, Tech Mahindra are partners to this partnership. Currently, we also have two joint calls with India that are open for application. One of them is in the area of smart grids and e-mobility, and the other one is in the area of smart cities, transportation, clean tech, AI, IoT, and digitalization. And I would, um, once I finish, I'll share the links to both these calls in, my, in the chat box. Um, as I mentioned, health is a very strong cooperation area. DBT and Vinova have had a decade-long partnership, and recently both funding agencies funded six projects in the area of digital health. We also have a Sweden-India Healthcare Innovation Center and a health hub that has been established at Ames Jodhpur recently. Uh, another area of importance is circular economy, where from the Swedish side, there is an interest to cooperate with India and a joint call will be announced later this year. Um, waste to energy is an area of priority in both countries, and there are already a lot of pilot projects between Swedish companies and Indian stakeholders that are running, uh, including the likes of a company called BioEndev, which converts um, wheat stubble into bio pellets and bio coal. And we're also in discussion between IKEA and the principal scientific advisors office, where we're trying to set up a pilot plant of converting paddy straw and, uh, and waste into MDF board that can be used for furniture. Um, under the innovation partnership, we also have an MOU between NASCOM and CISP, which is Swedish Incubators and Science Parks on uh, startup exchange. We've also had incubator delegations exchange between both the countries. Same is the case with intellectual property rights, where the Swedish uh, uh, Intellectual Property Office has had collaboration with DPIIT and the in Indian Intellectual Property Office in India. Um, in terms of policy, uh, there is a great interest of sharing innovation policy uh, between both the countries. And during the state visit of uh, His Majesty uh, to India, there was a high-level dialogue on innovation policy, which was inaugurated by Prime Minister Modi and the Swedish wow. King. And uh, some of you would know about India's science, technology, and innovation policy, which was launched early this year. And Sweden was also an uh, invited country partner to discuss more on innovation policy, uh, which helped in formulation of STIP. Uh, last but not the least, we are also having a lot of cooperation in the area of space. Uh, Sweden was a partner in India's moon mission, Chandrayaan, and it is now collaborating with India's Venus mission, Shukrayaan, uh, which will be launched um, shortly as well. Uh, leaving you with some pleasant images of Sweden here. Thanks for listening. We have a very active blog and a lot of uh, workshops, events, and funding opportunities are mentioned on the blogs, as well as on our Twitter account. So I would encourage you all to follow us. Um, and for those who are interested in knowing more about Swedish universities and postdoctoral opportunities, et cetera, I would encourage you to sign up to study in Sweden. 
and th this is a very exhaustive resource of uh, a lot of uh, updated information when it comes to universities and particular courses, etc. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you also to uh, the organizers for giving me this platform. Many thanks, Lena. I think there are specific questions with regard to, uh, you know, specific disciplinary areas and what are the opportunities for migration or refugee study in the Nordics? Would you like to answer that or would you like to, you know, deal with it in the chat box and the Q&A box simply because you've been doing that in as the webinar was progressing? Yeah, I think in the interest of time, let me um, put it in the chat function. That might be easier. And as I said, there are existing two um, um, joint funding calls which are open at the moment and they close soon in May. So I would really encourage for all of you who are interested in those areas to uh, look at the funding opportunity and apply for it. Uh, but let me take the questions in the chat box now. Thank you. Yes, one question in the chat box for you and there's one in the Q&A uh, window. So many thanks, Lena, for your presentation. Let's move forward. We now have with us uh, Egil Thor Nielsen, who is Senior Advisor uh, from the Research Council of Iceland. Many thanks for being here with us, Egil, and please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so, as you mentioned, my name is Egil Thor Nielsen. I'm from the Icelandic Centre for Research. And I am uh, in Iceland, so good morning from Iceland and good afternoon where you're sitting. Uh, what I want to do then quickly here is to sort of give a, give a briefing on uh, Iceland and then uh, RANIS, the Icelandic Centre for Research, what we do and how we hope to uh, be of assistance uh, for, for the participants here. And then uh, give you a briefing on the Icelandic sort of education system or, or opportunities related to higher education with uh, some focus areas. But it sort of dawned on me while I was listening to the presentations here that uh, background on Iceland might be a bit of use as well, uh, because we are, as the other Nordic countries, a small country and a smaller country in population than the other four countries presenting here, or five actually. Uh, we have a population of 370,000 people. When I used to live in Shanghai, I said Iceland had under a million people when it comes to population, just for people to think about a million, but it's 370,000 and two thirds live here in the Reykjavik area. So the capital part of the region. And uh, there are only nine mun municipalities with over 5,000 people. So the contrasts are quite big to India. And 95% uh, of the people live in the coastal area. And that does reflect quite a bit uh, on the economy. So Iceland historically has been a fisheries country and focused on that. And uh, the only sort of, uh, well, wars because they were on cod fishing rights with the UK that Iceland sort of has initiated uh, had a lot to do with the fact that Iceland could be sustainable e economically towards the future. And, and they took place in, 1958 to around 78 or so. And there was a famous quote by one of the chief negotiators at the time that uh, Iceland is a rock in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, take away the fish, what do you have? Uh, but since then we have sort of added on the economy and actually when it comes to fisheries and seafood, uh, now sort of the full utilization of fish has grown and uh, biotech and other aspects of seafood have entered, as well as uh, renewable power, renewable energy, geothermal especially, and uh, tourism pre-COVID, uh, as well as sort of the knowledge sector in general. So that's where I will be heading now. So when it comes to RANNIS, the Icelandic Center for Research, what we do is to promote research, innovation, education, and culture in Iceland and in international cooperation. And what we do then is to support the knowledge community and work, for example, closely with the public science and technology policy in Iceland. Uh, sort of in a nutshell, what we do here at RUN is, is to administrate 25 uh, national competitive funds and international 
programs. So if you have specific inquiries about Iceland, at least I can facilitate them because we have, have a lot of things in-house here and, and partnerships with other stakeholders in Iceland. Uh, there is a big increase actually since 2019, uh, last year and, and this year there have been uh, well, almost double the amount of applications due to sort of COVID relief packages uh, and other factors and there is a higher amount in uh, support when it comes to monetary terms here in Iceland now, which we find positive at least. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's sort of supporting research, innovation, education and culture in Iceland, what we do. And we sort of focus on international cooperation through European cooperation. And there have been uh, introductions on EURAccess and, and other sort of schemes when it comes to Europe. And we also participate in uh, Nordic cooperation and Nordforsk is then one way also perhaps to increase collaboration with India. And then uh, being in the Arctic, we, we have a strong focus on the Arctic, well, Arctic research. And I will actually end by giving sort of a briefing on that. And the Rannis does also facilitate sort of other international and including bilateral research cooperation. So to give you an insight sort of in this European aspect, uh, as has been done earlier by, by others, uh, Horizon 2020 and, and now Horizon Europe has been sort of the most important tool, you might say, here in Iceland when it comes to participating in international research and innovation programs. And uh, it's been uh, sort of a, a success story when it comes to Horizon 2020, at least. And this sort of builds then on this knowledge triangle of innovation, education and research. And I will be heading now to higher education in Iceland. So we have uh, seven universities, which I find quite good for 370,000 people uh, with around 20,000 students. And these universities all have their sort of specific focus. And I encourage you and these shares will be, the slides will be shared, I believe. To, to sort of uh, look better into the universities. I will give a brief outline of the three that uh, are offering PhD programs. And that includes then the oldest and, and largest university in Iceland, the University of Iceland, uh, which has five schools and 200, over 200 study programs in, in diverse fields and uh, a lot. And these universities and have uh, masters and PhD programs in English. Uh, not solely, but, but a lot of them are in English to mention that. <clears throat> and as I said, I, I encourage you to look into the websites uh, when it comes to these universities. And if you have specific inquiries, then I'd be more than happy to facilitate them. Uh, and of course, the University of Iceland is the partner in, in the Nordic Center in India from Iceland. Then you have Reykjavik University and their focus is <clears throat> on law, computer science, business administration and engineering. And then including uh, the Iceland School of Energy uh, and master's program, for example, in renewable energy, which have largely been sort of popular with with foreign or ex or yeah foreign students, uh, and then in Akureyri, which is in the north of Iceland, there are three schools: uh, health science, humanities, and social sciences, business and sciences. And there, the specialization is more on fishery science, and uh, an Arctic focus being sort of uh, Akureyri being the then Arctic capital of of Iceland as such. And uh, sort of to end on, on that focus when it comes to higher education uh, in Iceland in general, there, there is a strong international focus. And just to, men and to mention in that aspect that 36% of PhD candidates uh, are, are international students. That's since 2018. And of course that has included uh, students from India 
uh, and then finally, I want to go through some specific sort of programs and, and fields. And I want to mention GROW, which is a center for capacity development, sustainability, and societal change, uh, which offers training programs in priority areas uh, in Iceland, which is then fisheries, gender equality, geothermal training, and land uh, restoration. And this is sort of built on the well foreign policy goals of Iceland and the sustainable development goals and sort of where we hope that there are some uh, there is special special sort of special is a specialization that can be of use when it comes to international cooperation. And these are then training programs, five to six months and then based on postgraduate scholarships uh, in Iceland. And, and these schools are then run by sort of the specialists in each, each field. So for example, the fisheries training program is at the Marine and Freshwater Research Institute. The uh, gender equality one is at the University of Iceland at Etta Center. And the geothermal one is uh, now hosted by the Iceland Geo Survey. Uh, used to be hosted by the National Energy Authority. And I, I maybe want to point to this photo here, the sec uh, second one, because it's a recent photo taken uh, within a month uh, because we had a volcanic eruption in Fagradalsfjall in Geltingarfjall in Geltingadal. And these are actually students uh, studying in the geothermal training program that hiked up to look at it. and. And uh, hopefully post COVID, uh, some of you will be able to, to visit it. And it's very, actually very close to Keplavik International Airport. So it's a very convenient, uh, as you call, tourism uh, eruption. Although obviously there are uh, limited, amount, limited amounts of tourists these days. And then finally, the land, land restoration training program hosted by the Agriculture University of Iceland, so one of the seven universities. And uh, it's, uh, well, when you are talking about sort of the Iceland, uh, Indian, India uh, research cooperation, it's, I think it's important to mention sort of the role of the former president of Iceland, Olo Ragnar Grimsson, uh, who uh, is now the chairman of the Arctic Circle. He received the Nero Award for International Understanding in 2008 and dedicated uh, the funds or the prize money to uh, scholarships or fellowships for uh, Indian uh, glaciologists and, and students studying glaciology to come to Iceland and then uh, sort of worked with the University of Iceland on, on sort of implementing that. And uh, there have been these links that have been highlighted uh, when it comes to the third pole. And I recommend looking into the third pole environment website when it comes to sort of the three largest areas in the world that are ice covered, then the Arctic, Antarctic, and the Himalaya area, and sort of the interlinks there between. And there was uh, pre, well, before uh, COVID sort of closed closed a lot of things down. Uh, there was a very interesting seminar in March 2020 on India's uh, engagement with the changing Arctic, where former President Grimson was a participant, and the sort of links of the scientific research that uh, India is conducting in the Arctic and including at the uh, Hinadari station in uh, New Olsund. Svalbard, uh, there are these links that are important to understand when it comes to the climate of the planet, of course, and the interlinks between sort of, uh, the Arctic, Antarctic, and the sort of more mid-latitude levels. And to name a, an example where there are opportunities to find collaborators, and then including in Iceland for Arctic research, I would recommend the Arctic Circle Assembly. Uh, which has been annually hosted since 2013 in, in Harpan in, in Reykjavik uh, and uh, has 
well, gained a lot of momentum over the years and until well, last year it ha had been annually uh, with more than 2000 participants for, from over 60 countries. And India, for example, had a country session in 2017. And uh, there is a plan to have one in October this year and next year. And hopefully that, that will be the case. And then finally, I want to sort of point out this report that uh, Via Tranis did with the Stefansson Arctic Institute and the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network on uh, sort of a mapping exercise on Arctic research in Iceland. And there you can find the background and potential partners and sort of a introduction of what is happening in Arctic research in Iceland, including the fund mechanisms. So we did uh, sort of go through all the uh, funds that are administrated in Rannis uh, and the international participation of Icelandic researchers in especially European funding schemes, the two largest, the Icelandic uh, research fund and Horizon 2020 showed that around six to 7% of all allocations to research in Iceland are on Arctic research. So it's a, sort of a significant part of the research community here then. But I will leave you at that and please feel free to contact me if there are any further questions and uh, yeah, I just thank you for having me. Thank you, Egil. I think it was a fantastic presentation and it's always good to have Iceland represented within this kind of forum. And thanks a lot to, for letting us know more about the Grimson Fellowship as well as the interest in Arctic uh, research. Uh, thank you to you and thank you to the University of Iceland for arranging our contact with you at Rannis. Uh, there are no questions addressed to you, so I will move forward. Uh, to uh, the representative from Lithuania, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Yurakte, who is the head of international programs at the Research Council of Lithuania, Vilnius. Thank you very much for being here and please go ahead and make your presentation. Thank you. You're muted. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can see my presentation. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, the organizers in, uh, to, for the possibility to join this, uh, this panel, Nordic panel. And uh, I am from the Research Council on Lithuania. And uh, uh, firstly, I would like to, to introduce my country. The, the screen doesn't go. Somehow I can I cannot go to the next slide. Oh yes, okay. So firstly, I would like to briefly introduce Lithuania. Uh, we are a small country on the eastern shore of the Baltic Sea, um, uh, with a population around less than three million officially. Uh, we are members of the EU with the currency with euro currency. And our official language is Lithuanian. Uh, what is uh, with the language? We have a link with India actually because it's it's uh, uh, has uh, close relations or similarities with the Sanskrit language. With them. so Lithuanian is one of the oldest languages in 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 the world actually, and uh, so probably. Most of you know that uh, Lithuania is from post-Soviet space, but uh, actually the, we have a long history, uh, centuries ago, and the first name on Lith Lithuania, which is in our language pronounced Lietuva, um, is mentioned uh, um, thousand years ago, more than thousand years ago. So now about the sector of R&D in Lithuania. Uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, we are lagging behind the investment in R&D uh, less than twice from the, from the average of, of the EU. Uh, but we are in increasing our goal is to have in several years, a 1.5 percentage. Um, we have universities, private and, uh, and uh, and state universities, uh, also colleges sector. Uh, and uh, we have research institutes, uh, private also, and, uh, and uh, 
and state uh, and uh, we produce around three uh, to 400 PhDs graduates annually and uh, around 30% of uh, researchers work in business and industry. Uh, if uh, we are a moderate, uh, according to the innovation score, scoreboard of the EU, we are a moderate innovator. Um, anyway, we are catching up because uh, we improved uh, uh, the most from 2012 in this regard uh, by almost around 30 percentage so, uh, to compare the EU average around nine percentage. Uh, so we're catching up country in this context. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for your information, our sector uh, highly depends actually on European structural funds. Um, uh, which uh, make a big share of our R&D funding. And um, if this funding uh, is uh, spent, has to be spent uh, according to our national smart specialization R&I priorities. So for this period, uh, uh, for, the, for now we are in a bridging period, uh, the new period started uh, this year, but it is still uh, under the planning stage and uh, uh, to focus these limited resources in RNI, uh, we limit, we actually focused. Uh, previously, we had seven priority areas in RNI, and uh, now we made a, a better focus to to those areas which uh, we have the strongest uh, human and scientific potential. I mean, health technologies and biotechnologies. Uh, new productions, uh, sorry, uh, new production materials and, uh, I do not see my, sorry, uh, new materials and <laughs> I cannot see now the, the full, <laughs> full line and uh, Anyway, new production and materials and information and communication technologies. Now uh, about the Research Council of Lithuania. As we see, we have uh, we celebrate 30 years anniversary this year, and we are we were established uh, by our parliament, uh, and we still have an eye in the unique situation because we are not like uh, normally the agents funding agency under the ministry, but we are under the parliament, and we are the not only the advisory body for the parliament and the government, but also funding body. Uh, uh, now our main responsibilities embrace uh, delivering, as I already said, uh, uh, RNI policy and scientific advice. Also, we are ensuring uh, RNI quality by performing evaluation of RNI activities uh, and PhD studies in research institutes and universities and also the performance of institutions. And also the biggest part of our work is to provide competitive RNI funding and also foster uh, transnational and international RNI cooperation. Uh, we announce around 30 calls for proposals per year, uh, covering all career stages, including students, PhD, postdocs, early career and established researchers. Also international calls according to our bilateral programs, uh, participation in Horizon uh, uh, 2020 and now Horizon Europe uh, will be RNET co-funds, coordinating activities and uh, others. Also, we provide different uh, uh, financial means in terms that uh, uh, from top-down research to bottom-up research. Also, we support um, researchers' mobility, career, dissemination activities, and uh, we use different sources uh, of funding, uh, the state budget, the EU, as I mentioned, EU structural, structural funds, and uh, and other sources like uh, uh, EA mechanism, uh, mechanisms. 
uh, our budget, annual budget, uh, is not very, very big. It's to compare, of course, Nordic uh, countries. Uh, it's we have uh, from the state budget around 16 uh, million, uh, around 18 million euros annually, and uh, and additionally the same around the same amount from the structural funds. Uh, we also uh, act as uh, European Commission's national point uh, um, network, uh, network, and we are responsible for nine Horizon Europe areas. We share this responsibility of the national contact points with other uh, with other funding agencies in Lithuania, which uh, is mainly oriented to technology and to. To, 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 to business research funding and the Research Council of Lithuania is um, for, uh, funds, uh, finances uh, a fundamental and uh, experimental and, and uh, research and development. Also, we are participating and fund and fund and fund uh, our the participants in the projects in, in different uh, Arenas. Here you can see on the right uh, the list, the list, and uh, uh, as regards the horizon 2020, uh, we are somewhere. Our success rate is somewhere in the middle, but we are uh, making, uh, how to say, efforts uh, to improve it uh, by strengthening our national. Um, contact point system for the next period. As uh, for the international cooperation, we also administrate participation in cost uh, fellowship for ESA, European Space Agency, and also Baltic research program, which we implement together with Latvia and Estonia from funded from EAA and Norway grants. And also we have uh, uh, joint projects uh, and calls for for the bilateral in the bilateral programs with Japan, Poland, uh, Belarus, French, Latvia, and Taiwan, uh, and Ukraine. Da now we are coming to our uh, competitive funding. Uh, our competitive funding um, is uh, we announce calls, and uh, normally the evaluation of the proposals is made uh, 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 by international experts uh, and uh, everything, all proposals are submitted electronically in the system and evaluation is also uh, also made in, in the system uh, electronically. Only the panels uh, after the individual evaluations, they meet uh, physically for, for currently in the COVID context, uh, we also do it uh, uh, on using the internet tools so we have um, we which what what could be interested to indian researchers uh, they can participate we have two calls directly rela related to to foreigners uh, here you see attracting foreign researchers in smart areas and um, and another another uh, program is Brain Attraction and re Reintegration Program, Professors Program. Uh, this, these are individual, uh, these programs, these calls are um, targeted to individual proposals uh, where the researcher can apply and uh, the only condition is uh, he has to work or she, he has, uh, she or he has to work in the, in the Lithuanian Research University or Research Institute. Uh, also, uh, we have calls which are uh, we can participate. The foreign researchers can participate uh, in the groups, uh, or, or, or uh, for example, high-level research groups in project in smart specialization areas. Uh, I talked previously uh, about these areas, and also we have high-level R and D pro uh, projects individual individual grants uh, for uh, for early career and established researchers this is this uh, grant scheme is was created uh, according to european uh, research council scheme where 
the individual researchers can apply, and also this call is open to foreign researchers as well. Uh, also, we fund uh, the Maria Curie and ERC projects, which were highly evaluated and above the threshold in the Horizon 2020 program. And but because of the call uh, budget shortage, uh, they were, uh, didn't get funding. So, and but got the seal of excellence from the Commission. So we fund these projects as well. And also, we uh, the call. Uh, was announced for postdoctoral fellowships, um, which was also open. Uh, regrettably, uh, as I mentioned, these all calls are already closed, and um, and uh, we are now in, in a bridging period between two financial periods, and uh, now we are only uh, in the planning stage for for the next period. Uh, which is uh, now done by, which is now in the process in the responsible ministries. Um, and the calls, the first calls, uh, it will be announced in the, only in the uh, next year, in the second half of the next year. Uh, but we expect that some of these schemes, uh, which I showed you in the previous slide, um, will be will be continued in this period as well. Uh, anyway, we have uh, research groups projects where research uh, foreigners can be included. Uh, we announce it uh, annually in these calls, and they are uh, funded from the state uh, budget. And generally, uh, I can say that each program and each call in in is a Research Council of Lithuania is open to foreigners. Either it is the individual call or it is a call for research team. So if you contact a particular institution in Lithuania, you have contacts, you can be included in the project. The only condition is that for that period of the project, the researcher has to be employed in the, in the project. So it is briefly from my side. I will put uh, to, to, to the presentation my uh, email address uh, later on. And uh, if you have uh, any more questions, uh, specific questions, you will be able to contact me. So thank you once again for your attention. Thank you very much, Yurate, for your presentation. Uh, it's very good to have the Baltics represented here in this forum as well. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the Research Council of Norway. And you have no questions. There are no questions from the participants to you. And if there are any questions, of course, we'll give them your email address so that they can contact you directly. Um, since we've already uh, crossed our time, our schedule, uh, what I will do is I'll quickly wrap up this webinar by thanking all of you. So uh, on behalf of the Nordic Center in India, I thank uh, you first, all the panelists and the organizations and agencies that you represent here today. Thank you for your presentations, for choosing to spend your time with us today. Sincere gratitude to all of you also for being so actively engaged in answering queries via the chat function. Uh, thank you for agreeing to allow us to record your presentations this way we can reach out to more interested persons and um, also a uh, big thanks to all the participants we are one year into covid and with the associated fatigue that comes with it i know it is a challenge for all of us to be part of these kind of zoom webinars so i thank the participants as well for being with us uh, here today hopefully this has been a useful uh, platform to, to know more about nordic research opportunities and hopefully a lot more people will be interested via this forum, via this uh, program to apply for uh, research collaboration and uh, cooperation with Nordic and Baltic universities. Thank you all very much.